Uh, Christine Ebersol is one of the stars, and I was I just spent the weekend in Provincetown with Rosie O'Donnell, and Rosie and Christine are friends. And we were talking, and I think it was Rosie that was saying it. That was sort of saying like, no matter you're very um, Zelig or Zelig, like kind of or Forrest Gump, like anything that's ever happened, Christine's been in. You're like, wait, Christine was in that? Sort of just like a million, <laughs> like a million probably shows, you know, like Amadeus, all oh, right, Christine was in that. Like, oh, I love Tootsie. All oh, right, Christine was in that. It's like, well, Saturday Night Live show is funny. All oh, right, she was a cast member. It's just like weird, like anything you mentioned, you're like, wait, what? So Christine, what is with that? Why have you done well, so much? it's been nine years since I've done a Broadway musical. What? Nine years since I've done a musical. <laughs> So, Wait, all so, of those shows that were air, that were going on in between that, I wasn't in them. So if I mentioned, you say if I mentioned <laughs> Book of Mormon, you were not in that. Nine years ago. <laughs> right. Yeah, oh, Christine, yeah. wait, so Great Gardens was nine years ago? Nine years ago. No, 2006. I heard, a, I heard a rumor from Francis Truffell, the original Eponine, that you were recently in London. Is that true? That you're coming to London? Huh? Thank you. She was like, I think I saw Christine Ebersole is coming here. And I was like, maybe she's doing Great Gardens in London. Is any of that true? Well, not so far, but I guess, you know, you never know. Okay. Is that a line, James Snyder style, or is that really, you don't know anything what? about it? Well, because you won't admit the title of the show you just did. Yeah. So yeah, you have no plans to come to London? Like, I'll speak to you later about it. Yeah. When, when Grey Gardens closed in 2007, Scott Franklin and I went to London to try to get the show launched there. We met with several producers and every one of them said, oh, they won't understand it over here, darling. They like Mamma Mia. Oh. <laughs> so Frances is living in the past. She saw you eight years ago and she's like, I, I just saw this so. episode. Right. Okay, we'll okay, we'll show up. in the tube. <laughs> exactly. Or in a lift. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I say Saturday Night Live, I think people think I'm joking, but Christine Ebersole literally was on Saturday Night Live for a full season as a not ready to go for primetime player. What year was that? 1981, 82. So, I just come off the road playing Guinevere. <laughs> naturally. Yeah, a lot. That's a natural progression. <laughs> <laughs> Guinevere. And isn't that crazy? So did you live that crazy life where like you rehearsed all week and stayed up all night? Yeah, like, we did a 90-minute show in six days, live. And what was the cue card situation like for Saturday Night Live? Did you have it memorized or did you have cue cards? We had cue cards, but you kind of had to have an idea of what was going on. And what was it like during the week? Would you like sit in those writers' rooms and like have a cigarette and try to come up with a sketch? Yeah, my I really the the way that I think I felt that I could contribute was really through the music. That was really the way that I felt that I had confidence. And did you do did you do characters that sang? Yeah, I mean, I, we did sort of those KTEL records like you know Jesus in blue jeans and middle aged rock. You know, <laughs> the night my cuisine art broke down. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> so stupid. <laughs> and then you were with and it was Eddie Murphy's first season, right? Was he? No, like... it was his second. <gasps> oh, so he was. I think he was a not a regular, but he was a, a featured player during the Gene Domanian year, which was right after Lauren Michaels, right right after the original cast left. So, so that was, was 80, 81. So he was already like a mega star. Yeah, I mean, he was a mega star in the making. Mm -hmm. and did but you... the, none of it was during the Lauren Michaels years. So Lauren Michaels did not, you know, discover him. Right. It was Gene Domanian, and then Dick Eversole nurtured that along, because I was there during the Dick Eversole years. Because Lauren Michaels stopped during Saturday Night Live for like... He was gone for five years. Yeah, and Gigi Manion, who was Woody Allen's producer. Right. And then Dick Eversole. And then Dick Eversole, who was like Saturday Night Live Sports. And Dick Eversole picked you? Yes. Based on... Based on a... Simple no, it was based on a, um, on a screen test I had done for a... Te or a test I had done for a TV show that was called Love, Sydney with Tony Randall. Yes! Susie Kurtz got the part. <gasps> but I was... Um, when I auditioned for it, um, it was a serious scene actually, and Dick Eversole got a hold of it because it was for NBC. He thought that it was authentic and brought me in. I guess he knew that I could speak, you know, that I could uh, sing, so he wanted to add singing to the show. Mm -hmm. He wanted to kind of include that. So he kind of went in a totally different direction. I mean, every, obviously everybody else had been coming from stand-up. And I was quite up here. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, Genevieve, you know. Mm -hmm. Say Genevieve. So, yeah. you know, I saw your show, If It's Four Below, which, by the way, was amazing. And you talked about something I didn't really know much about, that you, uh, when you grew up in Winnecta, right? Is that mm -hmm. what it's called? That you ran away when you were a kid. How old were you? And what was your version of running away? Well, my, my mother wanted me to continue pia taking piano lessons. And I was taking violin, and I thought that was enough. But, you know, so she 
wanted me to continue piano lessons. I wanted to quit, and uh, she wouldn't let me. So I thought I had been served a grave injustice. So <laughs> I had no choice. I, I was I was searching for you know I was going to swim across Lake Michigan to find a family with a sense of justice. That would take me. Wait, wait, a how old were you? Uh, nine. <laughs> and had you ever swum in swum in Lake Michigan? Well, of course, yes, but not. This was February. <laughs> so it was a little bit. You know, by the time I got to the corner, our house was on a corner. And by the time I got to the corner, I thought, "Good God, I've got to walk a mile to Lake Michigan <laughs> in the pitch black, and then I've got to jump in the freezing cold waters and swim God knows how many miles to find a family in Michigan with a sense of justice that'll take me in." So I just I went out the front door and I walked in the back door. <laughs> but I did have my life vest on. <laughs> over, over, your, your over your coat and your life It was a lovely... No, no, no. There was no, no coat. Just a cardigan sweater. A sweater set, yeah. And my saddle it, shoes. That really was a lot of sliding because the, uh, there was no traction. <laughs> In that cold, wintry night. So I just have to keep focusing on this. How did you plan on finding a family, quote unquote, with a sense of justice? Like, where are you going to find in Craigslist? Like, where do you find that? Well, that was before Craigslist, of course. But, you know, I just felt that I was served a grave and just My mother didn't understand me. I wanted to quit piano. She didn't understand. No, you have to take. You have to keep taking. And did you, by the way, did The you, violin's not enough? No, it's not enough. Did you keep taking? Yes. And Yes, and the violin as well. And you weren't singing back then? Well, I was singing all the time, but, you know, not, not formally. Not you know, except older. in choir, you know, in third grade and stuff like that. I mean, it just as it went through high school, you know, everybody. But back in those days, everybody had to take an instrument. Everybody was in choir. Everybody was, you know, well-rounded in that way. I know, isn't that frustrating? Now, what about your kids? Did they get to take a lot of arts in school? Because my kid, like, they cut the chorus in her school. It's very depressing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Listen, I have my opinions about that. And um, I think it's, you know... When you have, when you take away, those are the, those are the very vital things. It's as vital as breathing, the arts. Know, art and music and dance and theater. And when you take those away, you take away the part of the brain that thinks for themselves. Oh, it's sort of like thought control. Take mm -hmm. away any kind of art. Yeah, you take that take that away, and so then you do, you you take away critical thinking. So that if somebody says, you know, Santa Claus is going to deliver presents to you and then in Nebraska the same night and you know then there's the part of you that goes wait a minute how's he going to do that right you know you just believe what you're told and you know you'll get the presents if you're sleeping <laughs> no one ever told me that because <laughs> so, <laughs> <Hanukkah Harry. laughs> exactly Hanukkah, no we didn't even have oh, that that's right you didn't you didn't that you didn't have Hanukkah, Hanukkah Joe? Harry. No, that was no. We didn't. We didn't fall for that shite. We're just like, let's yeah, acknowledge. Yeah. We just acknowledge. We're so Jewish. You, yeah, you can think for yourself. No. None of that. Yeah. None of that happened when I was a child. Nice try.